Welcome to a snooker special podcast with me, Marcus Stead. Gareth Allen played on the professional snooker tour between 2015 and 2017, but he's been playing the game since he was three years old and had a lengthy career among the amateur ranks before earning his Pro Tour card. In this podcast, Gareth discusses his life in snooker before we move on to talk about the realities of life for a modern professional snooker player. The game has been utterly transformed since Barry Hearn took charge of the governing body in late 2009. In that time, prize money has increased from £3.5 million to an astonishing £14 million today. There are more tournaments than ever before, but this means more travel and inevitably far more expenses, which hits the lower-ranked players hard. Is the game's governing body doing enough to help the lower-ranked players? Gareth, take us back to how it all began for you, because you became interested in snooker, first of all, at the age of three. Yeah, that's right. Um, My granddad, um, he's always played snooker for most of his life. Um, Wasn't a bad player, but he never never played to like a national level or anything like that. He was just more of like a a decent local league player. Yeah. Wasn't there something you told me once before about you you used to watch snooker on the television and play with marbles on the floor with a pencil? (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Um, Obviously, my gran used to watch the snooker all the time on the telly. Mm. So I used to go around around to my grandparents' house, and snooker would always be on the telly back then. You know, Stephen Hendry, Steve Davis, and and all them. Mm. Um, so I used to just put the marbles on the floor and just basically look at the screen and copy what they were doing. Um, so my granddad spoke to my nan and just said, "Like, we we got to get him a snooker table." So um, he got me a little four foot snooker table for for Christmas when I when I was three, and. Um, yeah, he just went on from there, really. He had to actually cut the legs down on that because it was I was still too a bit too small for it. So he had, to, he had to modify the table so I could reach it properly. Yeah, and then you went on to um, a six foot table by the age of uh, by the age of twelve, didn't you? Um, yeah, the six foot table that that didn't well that that followed quite shortly after the four foot table when I when I started to outgrow that because I was I was, I was gr- growing rapidly back when you're young, don't you? So um, I outgrow the four foot table, um, got the six foot one in. And I had that for a few years up until I was a bit older again. And then, um, yeah, just, just just used to get out now and again. But where I live, there's not many places you can go under 12 um, to get a full-size table. So it was quite difficult for me to, to get access to a full-size table. Um, so then when I was 12, I started going down to the local snooker club, which is sadly no longer around, as, as quite a few of them have gone in the past. Um and it just went on from there, really. I used to just go down once a week on a Thursday with my granddad. Um, got talking to a, a few of the lads down there and ended up joining a team full of young lads. And we joined the local league as a team of like 13, 14-year-olds, I think we were back at, back in the day. What's interesting is you were born in 1988 and you talk about yeah. gr- growing up in the 1990s and going to the club when you were <clears throat> 12 years of age. If the equivalent 12-year-old youngsters around today... They just won't have the opportunities, will they? No, I say a lot of the clubs around here have closed down. Even the social clubs in my area, they keep closing down, and um, it's 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 quite hard to get access to, to good facilities uh, in my area. I mean, there is one the club that I play at, um, where I work now at Airbus. We've got a social club hmm. down there, and we've got two really really good tables in there with proper either the proper match tables, Riley, and a, and a, a Westbury yeah. with um, the proper cloths on. So that's that's the best place around to play snooker. But in terms of snooker clubs, there are none. Yeah, Apart because from, right, I, I, I interviewed to... um, Ronnie Allen, the chairman of the Welsh Association, no relation of yours, I hasten to add. Um, mm. I interviewed him last summer on YouTube, and, and we talked about how clubs have closed, even compared to my youth here in South Wales. Uh, in Cardiff, there was the Riley Wellington, there was Riley City Road. Um, they were, we're now down to one club in Cardiff, plus a few private members' clubs that have snooker tables. And I've discussed this with Kishan Hirani as well. Um, he played at Riley City Road. It's bad enough here in Cardiff, but up in North Wales, there really aren't that many places, are there, where a youngster can go with his father or his grandfather, as you did, and really get into snooker and start playing in a serious way? No, not at all, really. Um, say a few of the clubs around here... They will let you in with an adult at certain times, but 
it's probably a rare, a rare occasion. Um, I don't see any young players really playing mm. around here, especially in the league. Mm. Um, the youngest players possibly, well, probably 18 now, maybe. Um, mm. I mean, the under-21 competitions back when I was coming through as a junior were, were really strong. You know, you had, you probably had a good 20 players in them, and you know, there, there's some good players coming through. Well, there's yourself and Alex Taubman in North Wales. Um, th- there were others as well, weren't there, who who made an impact? Yeah, there, there were. Um, I say our local league was was quite a strong league um, f- for young players. I say we had our own young team. And, um, there was only the captain Jeff that was. That was over well 30, 40, well, I don't know what old he was at the time, probably forty. Mm. Um, there, there was there was only him that was the older person in the team. The rest of us were under eighteen. Mm. Um, so even then, going round to social clubs on a Friday night trying to play snooker, even in the league, um, we had to get special permissions off some social clubs to even go in and play a league match because we were so young. Yeah, yeah, because um, Welsh snooker now, the generation coming through, we've seen this last few years. Obviously, yourself and Dwayne Jones, we'll talk about him a little bit more in a moment, but. You look at the, the generation a little bit younger again. You've got Jackson Page, Dylan Emery. These are very, very good players. And I'm aware of some who are younger again, you know, the Liam Davises. Um, and, and there are people I'm aware of even younger than that who, who are coming through. But they will not have the same range of tournaments to play in and the same practice facilities that you had as, as a man who's now 30 years of age that you had in the 1990s and even into the early 2000s. No, um I say there are a few good clubs in South Wales um, with, with with facilities. Um, but they're valleys, but, aren't they, rather than Cardiff? <laughs> well, yeah, um, yeah, they're at the, they're at the Cardiff city centre. You know, the, they are they are the the private clubs that you go to um, in in the small in the smaller towns. Mm. Mm. Um, I say I've not seen some of the younger players coming through. I've not really watched many of them. Obviously, obviously I know Jackson and, and Dylan Emery. They're, they're really good players. Um, but when, back when I was younger, players coming through, you had the likes of. Well, I was playing against the likes of Jamie Jones, Michael White. Um, you had Stephen Ellis, who's a good player. Um, Anthony Kreis is a good player. Um, you know, Di John. Um, he was he was a good player as a junior coming when I was coming through. Yeah. I, I had really top quality players. I was competing against week in week out in. Mm. So in, in, you in got, you got to 16 then, and that's when your first century happened, which was four years after you started playing on a full-size table. Yeah, play, yeah, playing properly on a full-size table. Yeah, I was 16. Um, that was in the local league match, actually. I, I hadn't had one in practice. Hmm. Uh, I think my highest break in practice was 89 at the time, and I played a local league match and managed to knock in 102 when I was 16. And then, hmm. uh, as it happens in many, like, the floodgates open then, um, when you get your first one. Um I remember holding my uh, my stepdad um, to um, his little thing. He said to me, "It was uh, when you get your first century, I'll give you a pound a point." So I'm coming from the league okay. match, and he had to stump up 102 pounds to me. Uh, and what did which, you do with which, that money? Which he duly give to me. Oh, I can't remember now. I can't remember last week, Marcus. <laughs> it may have uh, had something to do with cars knowing you. Uh, possibly. The, well, I wasn't 17 at the time, but. Um, I might have saved it and put it towards my first car, maybe. I, I can't quite remember. May well have been. But when you were that age, there was the, the Pontins International Series um, <clears> for <throat> amateurs, wasn't there? Lots of competitions at Prestatin. The late yeah. Malcolm Thorne, the brother of Willie Thorne, was heavily involved in that. And also John Williams, the famous referee, was also involved in the admin side of things of that. Great days to be a young, talented amateur snooker player. Uh, I used to love them days. Um they, they 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 were the best days in snooker for me uh, personally. Um, I mean, obviously, I was lucky. Pontins was in Prestatin, which is twenty five minute drive down the road for me, so I didn't have to stay there all the time. <laughs> luckily enough. Yeah. Um, but again, that's gone but, as well now, hasn't it? It has, which is such a shame because you speak to some of the old old players I used to play against you know, on Facebook and things, and like of so people like Stuart Carrington I still still speak to, and you know we, we talk about the old Pontins days and. Um, we used to have a good time down there, you know. It was so competitive. Mm. You know, you had the likes of obviously Judd, but he's he's similar my age to me. You know, I've grew up playing Judd, and Jack Lazowski was one of the ones tipped to come through. And obviously, he's done that now, in top sixteen. So, mm. um, but we were playing against these players every every month. But that was at Pontins. But in between all that, you had the under sixteen series and the twenty one series down at um, in Colville at at the Potters Bar in at, 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 where. Uh, Malcolm Thorne used to run the tournaments yeah. every weekend. So you know, it was it was a great time to play snooker when you were juniors. I think that's why there's so many um, 
there was so many good young players coming through because there were so many competitive tournaments to play in. Mm, mm. Um, but but so, so many people, the name Malcolm Thorne, and he's much missed because his name keeps coming up. <laughs> oh, when absolutely. Um, people it, of it, your generation, give or take a few years, whether it's people like Mark Selby and so forth, they all know the impact that Malcolm Thorne uh, had on their lives. And other, you know, people from overseas, like Andy Lee, the Hong Kong player, one of the first things he did the first time I met him um, at an international event is Andy Lee said to me, oh, I, I played uh, under Malcolm Thorne. And he was mentioned Malcolm Thorne's amateur competition. So his reputation is global, really, the, the way he helped um, a lot of young people round about your generation. Yeah, I, well, he's a legend. Mm. You, could, you, could, you could go as far as saying that because the things he used to do, put, put tournaments on for, for, for us juniors coming through, like... Mm. You know, it's it's helped us all massively. You know, we were all competitive from a young age, and you know, he encouraged it. And you know, he was all about teaching you to turn up on time and get dressed smartly, and mm. um, that side of the game as well. Not just just turn up and play play a tournament. Like you know, he he was he was t- t- taught taught you other things as well. Which this, you know, this is why I, I say I I think snooker gets young people into good habits, and I think this side of the game is sometimes underappreciated. Dressing correctly, turning up on time, having the personal discipline. And these are skills you can take into the workplace later in life. So this is why I think snooker is a force of positive, particularly children who don't necessarily have the best start in life or who don't have role models and so forth. They, they always say, isn't there, there's a cliche in boxing, and it is a slightly cliche thing. Boxing has taken a lot of kids off the street and given them discipline and so forth. And all that is true, but I think snooker has similar qualities in so far as Yes, you've got to be disciplined, dress correctly, turn up on time. And these are all skills you take into the workplace, even if you don't make it in snooker, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, obviously, you, we, in the working world, you know, you've got to be punctual, dress smart. And, you know, snook, you can take that from snooker. But again, like you're saying, you can take, you can teach kids things. But even through maths, just adding up the simple numbers, but working out how much is left on a table, adding, subtracting. Yeah. So it's, it's good to get the young kids involved in it at, at a young age, you know, because it can teach them many life skills as well as, um, okay, again, take them off the streets, but, you know, these days kids really aren't really on the streets that much because they're too busy with, um, like, iPads and Facebook and phones and stuff, yeah. which is another reason why there's probably less people... Um, coming through now in the junior ranks. Um, well, well that, that's right. There's a lot of... Time's moved on, technology's moved on, and there's a lot more things that they rather be doing. I mean, they can, play, they can play a game of snooker on the iPad now, and they don't even have to go out the house, and they're good at it. Well, it, yeah. I, you know, one of the things that got me involved in snooker was Saturday mornings at the old Riley Wellington, and there was a little gang of us, and, you know, we'd mix and match. Not everyone turned up every week, but it was a social occasion. I wonder whether today's 14, 15, 16-year-olds see things in, in quite the same way. But we're going we're gonna to move this on now, this discussion. Um, you took the plunge, first of all, when you were still quite young, you were getting fed up with your job, weren't you? And the Sports Council for Wales gave you a grant of £3,000. And you were given that money and you felt you had to do something with it. Yeah, that's right. Um, so when I was when I come out of uh, education at school, um, I wasn't good enough to turn pro at all then. Um, I wanted to play snooker, but, you know, I, I had to get, um, I had to get um, a trade under my belt or, and, and, and just, just do that, really, rather than pursue snooker um, and potentially, you know, never have anything to fall back on. So I, I got an apprenticeship with the local council in the offices doing IT. And I worked my way up there, to be fair. You know, I, I had a good job. I was earning good money. Um, but I was also doing snooker alongside that. Hmm. And um, snooker is obviously always something I've wanted to do. And um, it's always been a dream of mine to be a professional. And hmm. Actually, I got the the grant from Sport Wales, which I was grateful for, um, which enabled me to enter more tournaments like the PTCs and things like that. But I couldn't do it while working. Well, this so is in- this is the issue because this looking at the time <coughs> scale of this, we're now into the uh, the, the late two thousands, and Barry Hearn took control of the game in what late two thousand and nine. So this was an interesting time for you. You were of an age. You, you were still in your early twenties at this point, but yeah. PTCs. But they were started up very, very quickly within within a matter of weeks, actually, of Barry Hearn taking control of the game at that period. We'd gone from a situation where we'd gone from, what, six ranking tournaments plus the Masters, when snooker was at its lowest ebb, 
to suddenly this explosion of tournaments and the PTCs at that time they were at the Southwest Snooker Academy in Gloucester and they were at the Academy in Sheffield but already we were seeing weren't we yes opportunities to earn money but also particularly for the lower rank professionals and those who are not yet have had professional status a lot more expenses were starting to come in weren't they well that was it that's that's basically what it was um hundred pound entry fee and traveling hotels food and stuff so i was working part-time uh, and and then practicing part-time with um, players like andrew higginson robbie williams rod lawlers um when i wasn't working maybe on a thursday and a friday um so i started to keep my job and keep a bit of money coming in just to help fund the ptc really mm. um my family have always helped me out and they've been great with me um but it wasn't until um, I took the plunge and actually went full time full time snooker. Um, that I was lucky enough to get a sponsor straight away. Really, um, Chris Chuar from Eden Resources in Singapore. Mm -hmm. He does a lot to the ladies' game, and he um, he helped me out massively. He, he supported me all the way from my amateur career and then eventually the professional career, which we'll get to. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and Chris, you know he. <coughs> what was the arrangement there? Because you've been to Singapore a number of times and you, you've helped out there. What did what did you give Chris back in return? Apart from obviously the waistcoat sponsorship exposure, you did actually go out to Singapore a number of times, didn't you? Um, it was just the once I went out there. I thought it was more than that. No, uh, just the one. I've always wanted to go back. It's it's my, it's the, my favorite place on earth. You do um, talk about it a lot, and I can understand yeah, why. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, the it, club it, there was fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah, they, they've got good facilities over there. They've got an academy over there now, and they've got some. They've got two or three really good snooker clubs. Um, with good quality tables, live streaming on all tables and things like that, mm. tiered seating. So they've got a good setup over there. Mm. It, um, it looks it from the website. So so Chris was um, was very much involved and very supportive of you. So this, this situation then continued yeah. for the next few years into your mid-20s. And then in 2013, you reached the final of the European Amateur Championship where you played Robin Hull. And that was you were one game away from getting on the professional tour at that point. Yeah, oh, Robin played amazing. To be fair, in the final, um, I was gutted. Um, but there was a, there was a small squeak that he wasn't going to take his tour card, which gave me a little bit of hope hmm. after the final. Because Robin had been yeah. very ill, hadn't he? Yeah, he wasn't sure whether he was going to take his tour card or not. Um, because he obviously was travelling back and forth from Finland. He was settled in Finland, hmm. so I, I kept having conversation with Jason Ferguson um, as to whether oh is he taking it is he not he said oh, he's not giving his final decision yet so I was you know it was, I was waiting in limbo whether I, whether I got the tour card or not so I was just I was on pins to be honest with you yeah because uh, yeah. Yeah. for those who don't know Robin Hull was a very good professional I think from the late 1990s into the 2000s he made a number of appearances at the Crucible and then he had a problem with his, his ears um, which affected his balance and there were times where he could hardly move at all and, and it affected his career quite badly. It really affected his life quite badly. But that problem seems to be under control. In fact, he's played at the Crucible since, if my memory serves me rightly. Um, and um, But he, on that day, he was superb against you, wasn't he? He, was, he beat you 7-2 and he was right at the top of his game and he's made a successful yeah. return to the tour since. Yeah, so he, he, he beat me 7-2. I mean, he had back-to-back -back centuries to finish off the final. It was live on Polish TV as well. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, I didn't play my best. I, I, I will admit that I didn't play my best because mm. obviously there was a lot riding on it for me. And he'd obviously been a professional before, and um, he just handled he just handled the the final better than me. Yeah. Um, so he, he fully deserved to win. He you know he, he had so many breaks and finished off a back to back centuries. Like I said, it was just mm. you know just sitting there watching it, watching your tour card slipping away when he's knocking them balls in was was a horrible feeling, but. You know, it's an, it an achievement for me to get to a European final. You know, I've never been, I would never been that far in a competition before. Um, so it's a big stepping stone for me. And then uh, I, I was, was close to getting on school just, just after that as well. So It, it was. And, and uh, in the PTC events, you beat people like Kurt Mafflin, Alfie Burden, Andrew Norman, Joel Walker, Nigel Bond. These were all good players. And then you went to Q School. Um, well, it was a year before that, wasn't it? It was in 2012, where you lost to Paul Davison. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, and that that would have got you on the tour if you'd won that. Yeah, it would have. Um, I lost four two to to Snowy. I'm good friends with Snowy. You know, he's he's, a, he's he's been a great player for years. Um, hovering around the low, lower ranks of the the professional circuit, um, so I knew it was going to be a tough game against him, and it 
it was. It was a horrible, scrappy game, um, and he managed to probably use his experience to beat me. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I, I was obviously I was I was gutted again then. So I was. And how much did it cost you to enter Q School at that time? Do you remember? A uh, thousand pound. It was. There was yeah. three tools. It, 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 uh, it, it all it all adds up, doesn't it? Because okay, so then we had twenty thirteen. You had a, a similar situation in twenty fourteen where you were travelling. The PTCs by that stage were more spread out over Europe. Um, and yeah. then at the end of 2014, you went to the World Amateur in India. And let's just say your journey home was rather eventful, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, where do we start? <laughs> um, yeah, I come, coming back on the plane uh, home um, from Bangalore to Dubai, got about two hours into the flight. I think the flight was about three and a half hours, but it seemed like eternity. Um, I all of a sudden I had a sickness bug come over me um, violently sick and th- th- all the rest of it um, got off the plane at Dubai um, about an hour later and um, I was so weak could hardly walk um, I was with Dwayne Jones and Jamie Clark at the time as well um, I just said oh, I need to go in at the toilet I said you go on I said I'll catch you up in a minute but by this time I could hardly walk you know I was so weak and severely dehydrated um, almost felt like I was going to faint, you know, and I just had to go to someone quick at the security. I just said, I need help. Mm. So they got them. Um, to be fair, like the, the medical staff rushed there, and I was probably lucky it was in Dubai because they've got a hospital in the airport, and mm. I just got rushed straight into there, really. Well, um, well Dwayne has said to me in the past that he was quite shaken up by how ill you were at that time. He, he, it was pretty damn serious, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, he's looking at me. I can see the way he's looking at me, thinking, oh, "Well, I mustn't look. I mustn't look any good," because <laughs> mm. I can see the way he's looking at me. But I could see he had he had some he had proper worry on his face, and mm. you know, I've not seen doing all that before. So, um, at the end, they, they they looked after me in the hospital, um, discharged. To be me. clear, it was food poisoning, wasn't it? It was something you yes, eaten in uh, India that that had caused you to become very ill indeed. Yeah, I am. Um, well, me and Dwayne bought the same sandwich at, in Bangalore Airport just before we boarded the plane, I think it was. Mm. Um, we had no breakfast from the hotel, so we, we just thought we'd have something quick to eat um, just before we get on the plane. Mm. Um, but it affected me pretty much straight away um, after a couple of hours. So when it's settled in my stomach, my stomach's not look, not, not liked it. Well, uh, and Dwayne got I, off scot-free. <laughs> Well, he he didn't. Um, didn't he? It, it caught up with him a couple of days after he got home, which was a bit more lucky than me. Um, yeah. yeah, but but you know, to, to be serious, things were pretty bad for you. And I recall yeah, you and I was... met up in the September of the following <coughs> year, so we're well into 2015, and you were still on medication at that point. Um, yeah. It was... But so so your health was pretty poor for much of 2015, I think. But in in the spring of that year at Q School things went very well indeed for you um you made it through and you finally finally earned your professional tour place but it was a sort of you had mixed feelings about that because the last person you beat was a very good friend of yours yeah um i beat alex torbman to to qualify for, for the main tour which um it's bittersweet really because obviously i was elated to get on the tour after trying for so many years giving up so much like my job and everything and all all the all the work people in the behind the scenes are putting like my family had helped me out and um by putting like obviously the snooker room at the home and um, my sponsor chris um the help that they give me and push me um throughout my amateur career you know mm. Mm. It, was, it was just a wonderful feeling to finally do it um after obviously coming close twice as well at q school and mm. uh, and whatnot yeah um, yeah but then, on the other hand I've had to beat one of my best mates in, in Alex Torman to, to qualify for it and then knowing what he's going through now because I've been there, it's it's not very nice. Yeah, so, it, and you know I, I know how good a player Alex is as well and it, it must have been a difficult pill for him to swallow that. So it, it, yeah. I can understand you having mixed feelings. But So you've got a two-year tour card and this means you're entitled to enter all, of, all the tournaments but there's a lot of travelling involved and there's a lot of additional expenses. But you were up against it. You had a lot of bad luck um, in your personal life and with things because this stomach condition, inflammation of the stomach, which you were still in under observation for the entirety of that two-year period, uh, you had to be very careful what you ate and drink. You had, what, two members of your family were 
seriously ill. Your grandfather sadly passed away during that time. Um, so it was a, a difficult two-year period in your life, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, so I was fully focused on, on, on the tour, but, you know, probably just in the back of your mind, you've got other things going on that um, mm. that, that you worry about that you don't, mm. don't really show. Um, mm. It so must have meant thought, a lot to you that, that your grandfather did live to see you finally make it on the Pro Tour. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Because obviously he, he knows how much that I, uh, mm. how much I wanted it, and he's always, you know, following following me what, about what I was doing. So for him to see that was, you know, it was lovely for him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, M- much missed, isn't he? I think. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, because. Right. It's under difficult circumstances over that two-year period, you had some notable victories over Ken Doherty, Aditya Mehta, Barry Pinches, Kurt Mafflin. You didn't progress beyond the second round of any tournament. No, say I'd I'd won a couple of games, but when I was an amateur in, in the PTCs, and I got to a couple of the last thirty-twos and lost lost a decider to Marcus Campbell to reach the mm. the last sixteen on one occasion. Mm. Um, yeah, it's but the way the tour's set out, it's it's hard for for new and up and coming, well, rookie pros um, coming onto the tour because a lot of people that, that they just look at results and they think, oh, he's getting beat, he's getting beat, why is he getting beat? And then it's not until you explain that log- logistics of the tour with seedings and, and things like that and the financial pressures you've got as well um, that they start to think, oh, right, we didn't realise that and. Yeah, let, let's explore this in more depth because one of the big controversies in snooker is this flat draw system where there are a number of tournaments where it's 1 versus 128, 2 versus 127 and so forth. And the other problem is first round losers do not get paid. And there have been occasions where you have flown to a different part of the world. You have lost in the first round, sometimes on television because you played a number of televised matches. Then you're mm-hmm. on that plane home. You've played your hotel bill and uh, your plane ticket, and you haven't made a penny. There is not really, is there, a trickle-down effect. There's a lot more money in snooker nowadays. Prize money has trebled since Barry Hearn took control of the game. Top 16 are making good money. Top 32 are getting by. Maybe the top 48 are doing enough to make a sustainable living. Beyond that, it is not trickling down to the 128 who have professional status. No, I don't think so. Um, Obviously, the money's there, and... To earn it, if you, I mean, look at Dwayne last week. I did fantastic, earned twenty thousand pounds. But what else has he earned this season? It's three thousand pounds. So, mm, mm. because but, I, okay, it's given up to twenty three thousand pounds for the season. But when you look at expenses, you, you're talking nigh on ten thousand pounds possibly for the year if you're travelling to China a few times, India, um, a couple of European tournaments where, okay, like the Paul Hunter, um, you don't you have to pay to go there, and you're not guaranteed a penny. Well, we, so, ex- we explored this in some depth in Snooker Scene in September 2017. In your second season on the tour, you received £9,025 in prize money. Now, that was a significant improvement on the £2,775 you received in your first season as a pro, but it's still nowhere near enough to cover your costs. After deductions, the amount you received in earnings in that second year was £7,869.14, pence precisely. You were given an extra 2000 by Eden Resources, Chris, who we mentioned. You had yep. a loan from your grandmother of £3,000, meaning you had a total income of £13,069.14. But in the expenses column, entry fees, which have now been abolished, but when you were there, there were still entry fees, £3,550. Flights were £1,091.25. Visa and passport costs of £288.20. Hotel bills nine hundred and ninety pounds sixty eight. Food, car park, taxis and so forth, eight hundred and seventeen pounds and twenty eight pence. Petrol one thousand four hundred pounds. And so that comes up to eight thousand one hundred and thirty seven pounds forty one pence. So in other words, you had just four thousand nine hundred and thirty one pounds and seventy three pence to live on. You cannot sustain that, can you? That is not sustainable. No. Um you know, it it was it was it was a, a bit of a struggle to be fair. Um but you know, it's the sacrifices that you make to try and get to mm. where you want to go in the sport. Mm. Um, mm. Say, I've, if you look back at tournaments, I, I've always done better in, in the in the tiered format draws, um, where you're playing someone ranked similar round to you, and then you progress further up. Yeah. But obviously, Barry Hearn's 
moved away from that format and he's, he's gone for the flat draw 128 where it's top 64 versus bottom 64. Mm. But that, and then that even, gives a huge amount of protection to those players already in the top 16, doesn't it? Well, it does because he's also seeded the second round where number one, if they win their first round game, plays number 64 if they win their first round game. Mm. So in the second round, chances are number one is going to play number 64. Mm. And I think it was Alfie Bird and I seen, who was ranked 64 at the time, and Mark Selby number one. Yeah, I think I think he played in about four tournaments on the spin, maybe or it, it, within quick succession, because they both won their first round games and they keep playing each other because of the way the tournament was structured. Okay, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it's a wonderful thing that you you know you can be playing Ronnie O'Sullivan or Mark Selby or Sean Murphy, or people of that ilk. But at the same time, okay, they they've their experience in front of TV cameras and lighting and a, a packed audience and so forth. You don't have that. You can't no. really gain experience when you're playing people at that level and you're just getting walloped every time or most of the time. OK, I know you've beaten Ken Doherty and, and several other good, very good players, but it's not right, is it? It's, it's, it is it's slightly unfair, unfair that. I mean, now World Snooker have just brought in a new initiative where you get 10 or 15 minutes before you're due on the arena table to go and have a practice on it, which... Which is a very, I mean, that, that's a that's a brilliant idea because we never had that. I mean, yeah. I played on TV a few times, but it's so different to the back tables that you used to playing on. All the lights, the cameras, are there, the the crowd's even bigger. You know, the atmosphere's different. Hmm. Uh, the table plays different. Um, just just all that. It's a di- it's a different setup because you you're, okay, is, you can, not, you can try and put it to the back of your mind as best you can, but you are very much aware that there are people, potentially many millions of people, watching you on television, and you're very conscious of the cameras and the crowds. Okay, th- you get you get over it in time and you become acclimatized to it, but it does take time to make that adjustment. And putting you up against the Ronnie O'Sullivans and the Selbys and so forth it doesn't strike me as a particularly helpful way of going about things, shall we say? But, no, they're just they're chilling, aren't they? When they when they when they when they see oh, you... well, Ronnie O'Sullivan has used derogatory words like numpties to describe people in that position. <laughs> which yeah. I, you you fell off the tour at the end of your um, two year tour card at the end of the 2017 season, and you went into Q School and you gave it one last go. Yeah, uh, I probably wouldn't say that I give it 100. Um, percent Obviously, falling off the tour, I was. I was disappointed, but not overly disappointed that you know, oh, my, my life's over now because I'm, I'm I'm not playing snooker anymore. It was, I wasn't that bothered, mm. if I'm being honest. Mm. Um, I had into my mind before. Oh, I, I well, I knew I was basically going to fall off the tour. I had it in my mind that I I didn't really want to do it again. Um, I'd kind of I'd had enough. Had you fallen out of love with snooker by this stage? Um, well, not out of love with the game. Um, just, just had enough of, of of being professional. To be honest, um, I mean all all the hard work I put in, like the second year um, of 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 my, being on the tour, I spent half my time at home, and then I spent half my time down in South Wales and Cardiff. Mm. As you know, I used to practice with J- Dwayne Jones at near enough every day. Yeah, um, I mean he's got a great work ethic. I mean, it, and it's obviously paying off for him now, getting to the semi final of the German Masters. He was tremendous last week at the German Masters. Yeah, right. you, you it. But by this stage, your life was changing as well. You were approaching your 30th birthday. You were, what, 28, 29. Your girlfriend, yeah. Paige, was studying at Cardiff University, hence you were spending quite a lot of time in the city. Um, but then, of course, you get into an age then where you've said to me before, I don't know whether the, this was a throwaway remark or whether it's true, but you estimate that your family had spent somewhere in the region of £100,000 on your snooker over a sustained period of time, that is. But you get to an age where you do have to stand on your own two feet and you do have to think about getting a house, a car, a pension. Um, Obviously, once Paige had graduated, which she did last summer, you're a few years away from buying a house and everything that comes with it. You're assuming responsibility, which is normal at your age. You can't do that as a low ranked snooker player, though, can you? No, you can't. You you can't do anything. You can't you can't go out and get a mortgage and get stand on your own two feet. You know because you don't know when the next penny's coming from. Basically, mm-hmm. um, and you've got all these expenses that that come up with with playing. Okay, entry fees have gone now, which is brilliant. Mm-hmm. It was a bit too late for me, but but they uh, need to do more, don't they? This business of not paying first round losers, I think, is a huge mistake, because you know other. All right, snooker 
has suffered from many decades of bad management at the WPBSA and lots of things have been put right. But you can make a reasonable living as a lower ranked tennis player or a lower ranked golfer. No, not in the same league as the Roger Federer's and the Tiger Woods's of this world, but you know, en- enough to pay the mortgage and have a modest house and so forth. Yeah. For snooker, that is not the case. No, um, I don't know. I reckon they should just cut the tour to sixty-four and then have a secondary tour, hmm. take a million-pound prize money off off the main tour, hmm. put it into a secondary tour. So there's there's some good money that people can play for, hmm. Hmm. Um, and then pay everyone in the sixty-four, pay pay them a wage. So that's your message uh, to Barry Hearn and Jason Ferguson, is it? it, it make make message. sure the trickle down actually does trickle down to those outside the top sixty four in particular. Yeah, because say it's what's one reason why I packed in. You know, it's just so tough to work your way up. I mean, obviously players do it. You know, you have got your exceptional players that that do make it up, and they'll probably do it on any system. But you know, you look at the tour now. You've got a lot of players down there that are always going to be down there. Yeah, because it, it's so tough to, to to work your way up, and I mean. Look at the UK Championships. I I paid. I think it was four hundred pounds to enter it. Um, I just I knew I was going to be playing near enough a top sixteen player when I entered because mm. of the way it's formatted, like one versus one two eight and two versus one two seven. So yeah, your your story does have a happy ending because you came off the professional snooker yeah. tour and now you're an apprentice at Airbus. So things have worked out for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Airbus is big and poor around by me. Um, and you're keen, you're keen on aviation anyway, aren't you? You've taken yeah, interest in, it for many interest years. in aviation, yeah. Um, so it was probably a natural thing to do, really, when I when I stopped playing, is to look for a new job to go. And um, yeah, I just I just applied for an apprenticeship there to become um, mm. an engineer building the wing in the wings down down in the factory. So mm. I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's a good skilled job. It's well paid, and um, I'm, I'm I'm really enjoying it at the moment. I mean, I'm in full time college at the moment. Going going back to education at thirty was a bit of a culture shock, but um... uh, but this is leading somewhere. A few years from now, you'll have a set of skills, and this will give yeah. you that house, that car, that pension, all the things that snooker did not give you. And when you when the time does come to start a family, both you and Paige are in skilled jobs. Things are gonna be all right. You're gonna have a far higher standard of living. Yeah, so the future's looking good now. I'm, 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 I say I'm enjoying my job. Um, I actually bought a new car for my thirtieth. <laughs> you know me and my cars. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a big car enthusiast. I know. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, I treat myself off my thirtieth birthday, so I bought a new, I bought a new car when I got the job. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm, it's the future's look, looking looking bright now. I, I'm enjoying it. I don't miss snooker at all, to be honest with you. To, but but you're, still, you're still involved. Uh, you've got a co- coaching qualification, WPBSA coaching yeah. qualification. Do you actually do very much with that, or is your, your yeah, work taking up a lot of your time now? I say I'm quite busy with work, but I get most of it done in in, in work time. To be honest with you, there's quite a lot. I mean, I'm quite far ahead in in the work and in my studies at the moment, so. Mm. Um, I don't want to get that bogged down because I've got no time to myself after work if I don't get all my work done. So yeah, um, but yeah, I'm quite busy with the coaching. Um, I, I, I've got a few regulars that come come and see me uh, for coaching, and um, hopefully I can give back to people what I've learned um, while being while being a professional and help out people in the local area. I um, think, in conclusion, I just won't make one final remark on this and one final question for you. Okay, we know being on the professional tour was very difficult. It cost you a lot of money. There were lots of flights home where you were thinking, hang on, I've gone halfway across the world and not made a penny here. And in fact, this cost me money. But over this long period of time, a period of about 25 years, you've traveled the world, you have met people, you have experienced different cultures, different ways of life. You've met people, particularly at the IBSF and EBSA events. There's a good camaraderie and a good chance to socialize and meet people. You have experienced things in amateur snooker and then in professional snooker that people who sat alongside you in school will never experience. So it, a lot of positive has come from it, hasn't it? Absolutely. I, w- I wouldn't change what I've done for the world. Um, that's why one reason why I quit my first job out of school because you know I'd, I don't want to sit behind a desk doing, doing IT for the rest of my life. So you know, I've met some amazing people all around the world. I've been to some amazing places, and you know, I so I would not change it for the world. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I've still got some great mates that are all my snooker friends, and yeah. I still speak to a lot of them, mm-hmm. you know, daily now. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not. I just just don't get to see them as much at tournaments. Yeah, it's all like. Um, See, so yeah, I still speak to Dwayne every day. You know, he's he's always going to be one of my best mates. Yeah, um, oh, he's he's a good lad, and it is good to see Dwayne now. 
people have been tipping him for this for a good few years, but hey, German <coughs> Masters semi-finalist. We're only a week away now from the Welsh Open. Um, he nearly beat Judd Trump at last year's Welsh Open. That was a terrific match, actually. Um, he's going places, I think. Yeah, hopefully. Um, obviously, I, I practiced with him for a good year. Um, solid um, down down in down in his Trakenis when he used to have his table there. I mean, seeing him in practice, like you think him. I, I want you beating some of the players that he, he lost to on the tour when it, when I was when I was on the tour. You know, you, you think you're a lot you're you're a lot better player than what your ranking showing. Um, but again, it's 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 hard to work your way up, and hopefully this now he can build on it and um, he, he can get in the top sixty four. That's that's the aim, but even that's going to be tough. So if he stays on through the one year list, great because he gets another two years. But he loses his ranking points, so he's got to start all over again. Gareth Allen there. The message seems to be that professional snooker is in a much healthier state than it was ten years ago, but more could be done to help the lower ranked players. If you enjoy snooker podcasts, do a search on iTunes or SoundCloud for the Snooker Scene podcasts, presented by my colleague David Hendon. Thank you for listening. Goodbye for now.